When you travel around Iran and you visit many of the big historical cities like Esfahan, Shiraz, Kashan, Kerman and Yazd, right in the middle of the city you will see three things. A bazaar, a mosque, a bathhouse. A bazaar, a mosque, a bathhouse. A bazaar, a mosque, a bathhouse. So the bathhouse or the hammam is more than just a place to get cleaned. In the history of Iran, bathhouses have been the scene of many things like washing yourself, flexing your architectural ability, and getting... Welcome back to Narciss. Here, we explore what is in and beyond our cozy hostel in the city of Asmahan, Iran. And we talk about everything like food, art, culture, and handicrafts of Iran. Today, we'll show you what goes on inside a traditional 400-year-old bathhouse. When you look at traditional Iranian bathhouses, the mesmerizing architectural design, the intricacy of the many different rooms and tunnels, and the beauty of the interior design is just baffling. But why all the fuss for a place to wash your armpits? Well, it's much more than that. First of all, let's talk about the word itself. The word in the Persian language for bath and bathhouses is hammam. And that's the name they have come to be known with around the world as well. Hold on, I've heard all about Turkish hammam and Moroccan hammam. Isn't it all the same? Not at all. Yes. There are some similarities between hammams from other countries and the hammams in Iran. But 90% of what you see in Iranian hammams are unique to the land. To understand the significance of hammams, we'll approach it from different angles and we'll talk about the history, the architecture, and the culture of hammams. When anyone talks about bathhouses, especially historical ones, you immediately think about the Roman bathhouses of old, where people of power gathered for washing and talking about affairs of state. But the Iranian hammam that we are talking about is not as old as the Roman Empire. There were public bathhouses in Iran in the Zoroastrian times, but bathing and cleansing really became super important during the Islamic era because cleanliness and purity was very motivated in Islam. There are some hammams that were built during the Ilkhanid era in the 13th century, but the concept of hammam that we are talking about flourished during the Safavid dynasty in the 16th century. The capital of the Safavid Empire was in fact Isfahan for the majority of their reign. That's why you can find a historical masterpiece of a hammam wherever you look around Isfahan. Hammams kept popping up all around Iran in major cities like Kashan, Kerman, Shiraz, and during the time of Qajar dynasty in Tehran as well. They were an important part of the life routine of the people for centuries. Hammams have also been an important part of history of Iran. For example, this is Mirza Taqi Khan Amir Kabir, the Chancellor of Iran in the time of Nasr din Shah. He's praised in history for the way he promoted culture and built dozens of schools and promoted newspapers and media. He is undoubtedly one of the most positively influential figures in the history of Iran. And like most great people, he was rewarded by getting right here in the Finn bathhouse in Kashan. Hammams are ideal places for killing people because no one is carrying a big weapon and the screams of terror just get lost in the echo of the sound of the water. So bathhouses are an important part of Iranian culture. But in this video, we will be focusing on the hammams of Isfahan as the main hammam city. In every district of Isfahan, you can find a hammam for the residents of that district. Or at least you could. Many of them are destroyed or in ruins right now, except a handful that we're going to visit today. 
before we actually get into the hammam guys, tell us in the comments if you have anything like the public bathhouse culture of Iran in your own culture. We're curious to know about it. Imagine you're a hard-working citizen in the 18th century and you've worked tirelessly for a week grinding away at your job and now you're all stinky. Naturally, there is no concept of personal baths at homes yet. So it is time to relax for the day and go to the hammam. And of course, not alone, with your family together. And you're not gonna have any plans for the afternoon because your bath is gonna take from the morning until the sun sets. So you pack your things and you set off to the hammam. If you're lucky enough to live close to a massive hammam like Ali Goliaga Hammam, then you will have separate areas for baths for men and for women. So the men and the sons go in the men's section, and the women and the kids, if the kids are young enough, go to the women's section. If you don't live close to such a big bathhouse, then the women have their own separate time of the day or different days to bathe. Notice that the whole structure of the hammam is built a little bit lower than the ground. This way, water can flow into the hammam easier and the heat wouldn't dissipate easily. So you get to the hammam and walk into the first section of the building. The architects of the hammams care about the people's well-being, so the structure is built in a way that you wouldn't go directly from the dryness of the outside to the wet and damp hammam. They ease you into it, and here is how. First, you enter the entrance room that is usually small with a tiny dome on top, with a tunnel that leads to the inside of the bathhouse. Once you walk through the tunnel, you enter the first main part of the hammam, which is known as Sarbine. Sarbine is the place where you take off your clothes, put them in a pile in one of the corners, put your shoes in one of these places, and if you're a man, you would wear a pishtamal, or as we call it, a long. And if you're a woman, you would wear a towel-like cloth called qatife to cover up your upper body. Sarbine is a grand space, and it is normal temperature and dry. It is most of the times shaped like an octagon, or rarely like a square. In each of the parts of the octagon, there are places to sit and chill a little bit, maybe take a nap, chat, drink tea, and socialize. On some of the platforms, there might be a small pool of water as well. Right in the middle of the Sarbine, you can find a large stone basin filled with water that you can drink. Sarbine is usually made of brick and plaster. And this is where you can see the most decorations and paintings on the walls. The Sarbine is usually covered with a dome with a skylight right in the middle that gives a very cozy ambience to the room. The skylights that are built in all sections of the hammam are the only sources of light. That's why the bathhouse doesn't work after the sunset anymore. When you're ready to get to the washing part of the business, you can make your way through another tight tunnel to the next room. Welcome to the actual bathing part of the bathhouse. This is what we call garm khane, which literally means warm room. This part of the hammam is almost fully made of marble and it has different sources of water where you can wash yourself. There are usually a few small pools of water on each side of the garm khane where you can scoop water with a copper vessel and pour it on yourself. We will get deeper into the different traditional vessels and soaps and things that people used in hammams back in the day in another video. Here is where you can use the services of the hammam workers that are called dalak. Back in the day, dalaks were the real deal. They could do anything. Mainly, they would sit you down or lay you down on the floor of the hammam and then they would wash you. 
like really wash you. The main job of a dadlock was to scrub your body and especially your back and also they would do a hardcore kind of massage. But they were also fluent in the ways of many other crafts. They would relocate any dislocated bone, they would heal your body aches and they would pull teeth even. Let's just say they were the chiropracts of the old days. This is a part of the routine of a hammam massage in the camp. But certainly, one of the most iconic parts of the hammam is this part. This is the khazine. It is like another little pool with the smallest entrance. It is filled with hot water and the water is heated with fires either under it or to the side. After you've washed yourself, you can squeeze into the khazine and take a plunge. This act, getting full body into the water at once, is also a part of one of the Islamic cleansing rituals, so people took it seriously. But the dark side of khazine is that the water in it wasn't cleaned that often. You can't easily access the water through this tiny entrance. Imagine the filth from hundreds of people in one pool. Yeah, that's why khazines in hammams throughout Iran went out of order about a hundred years ago during the Pahlavi era. Another part of the hammam that you can enjoy if you're lucky enough to be in one of the big hammams like Ali Quliyaqa or the princess hammam is the large pool that was built inside it. There is no such pool in smaller hammams. While you're being washed in the Garmkhane, you can enjoy the architecture of the rooms and the ceilings. It is something that is quite unique to the Persian hammams. You will see a lot of domes with skylights in the middle. You will also see some paintings or tile works, but they will be less than the decorations in the Sarbine. The paintings in the hammam aren't masterpieces by famous painters. They're usually much simpler with little details or attention to the techniques of miniature. While the dadlock is scrubbing your back, you suddenly remember that you haven't liked the video and subscribed to the Narcissus channel yet, which would really be appreciated. In general, hammams have these main parts. Sarbine, the tunnel connecting it to Garmkhane, and the Garmkhane. Depending on how small or large the hammam is, there could be several of each of these parts. Here, for example, is the small Garmkhane of Ali Quliyaqa hammam, and here is the small Sarbine. So, getting back to you who is now fully cleaned and feeling refreshed, it is time to get back to Sarbine. Before you go back, you need to step into the cold water pool so you wouldn't shock your body going from a warm place to cold. Now back in the Sarbine, you can dry yourself and change back to your clothes. But before that, no better time to sit back and relax. Have lunch, drink a cup of tea perhaps, or smoke hookah while you're talking to your neighbor or the butcher that you buy meat from or the bread baker lady of the neighborhood. You can talk all about your problems at work and how the king's men are not treating you well. But as it gets darker outside, it means it is finally time to go home. So as you saw, Hammam was not just a place to get cleaned. It was mainly a place to meet with other people and gather around, talk about the matters of the city and of your business. The mosque and the hammam were the places that people talked about problems and came up with solutions and made decisions. Also, other than the main function of the hammam as it was used daily, there are some traditional ceremonies in Iran that took place in the hammam as well. For example, Hanabandan is the name of a ceremony where the women of the family of the bride and groom would take the bride to the hammam, sing and dance and give gifts, and they would put henna on their hands and feet. It's the Iranian version of bachelorette party. There is also the bridal bath, where the men would take the groom to the hammam and sing and dance while the dalak washed the groom. Then they would dress him in the groom's clothes and send him off to the wedding ceremony. The same thing would happen on the bride's side as well. 
Oh, and let's not forget about the life-changing function of the hammam. Ladies used to go to hammam to find young women beautiful enough for their sons to marry, or to introduce them to others who needed a wife for their sons. Although hammams and the whole concept of public bathhouses went obsolete about 70 years ago by the rise of the in-house bathrooms, the experience is not completely lost. This experience of a traditional Persian hammam is still available for people in many cities around Iran. For example, in Esfahan, Qazi hammam provides this authentic experience for the people. But of course, no one comes here just to get cleaned. It is the elevated, intimate experience that draws people. The appeal is in the way that you can just sit inside a piece of architecture, a piece of history, not just as a viewer from a distance like you would do any landmark, but as a user, as it is meant to be used, and to just relax with the sound of water echoing around the domes and the pillars and the paintings and the mist of the hot water boiling. Thank you guys for watching the video. If you have ever experienced a hammam, tell us about your experience in the comments. We are curious to know which part of the hammam you think is more interesting and which one you would want to experience yourself. If you have any questions about anything related to Iran and traveling to Iran, put it down in the comments or come over to Instagram or the website for more info on Iran and the Narciss Hostel itself. Also, please hit the subscribe button and check out our other videos. We recently went on a trip to Kashan and filmed the Kashan parts of the video and we're gonna have a video on Kashan carpets real soon. So if you're interested in knowing more about the life in our hustle and the culture, art and food of Iran, check out our other videos. See you guys in the next video.